Good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Micklin. Thanks for joining me this morning. As we have done for the past several semesters, at the end of the semester, I invite some of my honor students onto the radio with me to present their honor speeches. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. I have three honor students who are with me this morning here in Studio A to present their honor speeches. And here they are. They can't wait to present to you this morning. And so we're going to get started with our first student to uh, present, and that is Willow. Willow, you ready to go with your honor speech? You can start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Mr. Micklin. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Willow Blakely, and today I wanted to talk to you about the most interesting blend of philosophy and religion, Buddhism. As a Buddhist of over 20 years, I take what I say from translations of Hindu and Buddhist texts like the Pali Canon, the Upanishads, and the various Vedas, or sacred Hindu texts, in conjunction with my own experiences. The reason I source the Upanishads and the Vedas is for the same reason someone might mention the Torah or Old Testament when discussing Christianity, as Buddhism is to Hinduism and what Christianity is to Judaism. Buddhism comes from what is today Nepal around 600 BCE, founded by Siddhartha Gautama, who pro uh, was proclaimed the first Buddha. Unlike most religions, Buddhism has no dogma or hierarchy of <clears throat> order and divinity. Buddhists can believe in gods and goddesses, but it is not inherent in the teachings to do so. Salvation does not come <clears throat> from on high in Buddhism. No sacrifices or redemption is needed for salvation. The concept even of salvation is maybe not even the most accurate for Buddhism either. Rather, Buddhists believe that there are four noble truths to life, must be acknowledged, and that one should adhere to the Noble Eightfold Path of Buddhism, and, and they believe in the concepts of Maya, keeping us in a trap called samsara, where we are masters and victims of karma, and the only escape is through nirvana. But what are the Four Noble Truths? The Four Noble Truths are the foundation of Buddhism and fairly straightforward. The first Noble Truth is that life is suffering. Every single being born will die. It is the condition of life, <clears throat> and this death often includes pain, sickness, fear, and what we would most often agree is suffering. The second truth is that suffering is the result of desires. Think about it. If you are suffering from an injury, then it is because you desire to be uninjured. <clears throat> if you are sad that you are alone, it is because you desire companionship and acceptance. If you did not get what you want, that and that makes you upset, that is because your desire for things to be uh, different than they are, and this difference between our desires and our reality gives space for the suffering. The third that there is that there is a way to escape the cycle of desire and suffering, and many other cycles. The Buddha believed that it was possible to eliminate suffering because he claimed to have eliminated suffering in his own life. No sacrifice is needed, no forgiveness, simply learning to accept the world as it is and not as we wish it were. Finally, the fourth step, <clears throat> or truth states, escape is possible through the following the Eightfold Path. While it is simple to say, accept what is, reject what is not, it is not an easy practice, and many consider it an impossible worldview to maintain. To this end, the last truth states that if one could maintain balance in their lives by following the Noble Eightfold Path in our day-to-day -day lives, one will find Zen-like acceptance easier. But what are the Noble Eightfold Truths? <clears throat> or paths. Um, these are set, a set of guidelines to live in harmony with society as an individual, which gives the foundation for better practices of mindfulness, peacefulness, and loving kindness in the hopes of escaping the cycles of suffering. There's correct view, the concept of remembering that we are trapped together in this cycle of suffering, and that our actions have impacts on others even long after we are gone and forgotten in unseen and unpredictable ways. Correct resolve is keeping the resolve <clears throat> to live a life of nonviolence and to not practice hateful conduct. The third is correct speech. It is keeping in mind that our words have more impact on society than we'd like to admit. And so no lying, no rude speech, no inciting speech, or no hate speech. Some of the more strict Buddhists also <clears throat> extend this to no idle chatter, which has cultural impacts on much of the Eastern world. Fourth is correct conduct. We all need to act right. No killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, and no coveting thy neighbor's stuff. The correct livelihood is number five. Do not 
Take a job that would make you break your previous statements. Do not sell people weapons, poison, violence, and dealing in the death or sale of animals. Number six is correct effort. And that is to try to do your best to live um, by these guidelines and to try to cultivate a wholesome state of mind and being. Number seven is correct mindfulness. Practice meditation. Cultivate practices of mindfulness in every aspect of your life as life is fleeting and our journey is one of impermanence. So do your best to not miss a moment of it. And finally, there's correct samadhi. I like to think of this as right focus, making sure to put meditation, loving kindness, and other forms of mindfulness at the forefront of your practice, as this will leave less room for unwholesome mindsets to emerge later. I wanted to talk to you also about some of the concepts of Buddhism. For instance, what is Maya? Maya is the Sanskrit word for illusion, and for Buddhists it refers to reality. The Buddha believed that the world around us is not as it appears. That doesn't mean that it isn't real or unimportant, it's just that reality is constantly changing. To be metaphoric, it is like a stage that changes to match a play while the background of the theater the stage is housed in never really changes. So too, this reality around us and existence is dancing and playing out in front of us on a void of nothingness attributeless, absolute, or Brahman, depending, depending on the name you want to give the background. And what about karma? Karma is misused oftentimes and overused by Western civilization and for many decades. Karma is the system by which the macrocosm mirrors the microcosm. That is to say that the way you treat those around you, how you treat yourself, and even how you think about those things gets amplified by society in ways that we cannot always understand. It is not as simple as saying, do good things, good things happen to you, and vice versa. It is much more complex. And what is samsara? Well, samsara is the wheel of suffering, um, the wheel of life and death, the system of death and rebirth that continues till someone realizes the true nature of themselves and reality, finally attaining nirvana. And nirvana is the state of enlightenment that can liberate individuals from samsara, allowing them to be simply without definition. There are many debates on whether nirvana is a permanent state of consciousness or being, or if it is temporary and maintained. In conclusion, Buddhism is a large and ancient religion and philosophical practice that started in Nepal with one person named Siddhartha. Buddhists believe that there are four truths to this existence that, the, uh, that are universal for all beings, that there are eight suggestions to live life that make enlightenment easier for us, and that there are unique concepts that apply to every Buddhist called Maya, Karma, Samsara, and Nirvana. That said, there is so much more to explore that I simply do not have the time for, such as the schools of Buddhism, the five precepts of Buddhism, the three gems of Buddhism, and its history from the birth of Siddhartha, to the religious wars in Japan and the appropriation of Buddhism in the 60s by a group of Englishmen for the salvation of counterculture in the West. As a proud Buddhist, I'm going to share, I'm glad to share what I can with you. And I thank you so much for your time and consideration. I only ask today that you take a moment to wish the greatest happiness you can imagine for those in your life, those who trespass against you and for those you have trespassed against. For as Buddhism teaches us, the first step in changing how we feel is changing how we perceive the reality of illusion around us. Thank you. Willow, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is uh, Willow, one of my honor students uh, in the fall or summer semester, I should say, here at San Juan College. And we're wrapping up because today is our last day together. And so they are here presenting their honor speeches. Next is LaCoya, who is here to present her honor speech. And so, LaCoya, we're ready whenever you're ready to start. Okay. <laughs> It may, be easy, it may be the easiest way to calm down a restless or misbehaving child, but to think about it, is handing over a phone or a tablet doing your child long-term harm? As college students, we are on our phones or screens 24-7, but is it really safe for adolescents to be on their screens as much as college students? The answer is no. Children as young as one could develop long-term developmental delays. Today, I will be telling you all about the potential impact, <clears throat> sorry, the potential impact of excessive screen time on a child's development, early signs and factors of developmental delays, 
and finally strategies to support healthy child development. My first point, the American, the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, recommends limiting screen time for children ages to ages one to two years to no more than one hour per day, said Healthline.com. Excessive screen time during, during early childhood may potentially impact various aspects of development, such as cognitive skills, which is problem solving and understanding information, social and emotional skills, which is including interaction with others and managing emotions, speech and language skills, which are affecting communication and comprehension, and fine art and motors, fine, fine and gross motor skills, <laughs> influencing coordination and physical abilities. A study in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, observed that the increased screen time between ages two and three correlated with poor development outcomes at ages three and five among 2,400 children in Canada. On to my second point. The early signs for developmental delays may include delays in physical milestones such as rolling over, sitting up, and crawling and walking. Challenges with fine motor skills, speech, problem solving, social interaction, and memory. Inability to grasp consequences of action. While the exact causes may be developmental delays remain unknown, genetic factors like Down syndrome and Fragile X syndrome can contribute. Environmental factors such as exposures to toxins, premature birth, low birth weight, and health conditions like chronic ear infection or vision issues can be also increased and increase the risk of developmental delays, said Mike Cleveland, my.clevelandclinic.com. On to my final point, the strategies to support healthy child development. The AAP advises parents to limit screen time and choose high quality content for children ages one to two watching alongside them to provide guidance and understanding. Dr. Alex Dimitri had told Healthline.com that he had emphasized that importance of monitoring child's, children's screen activities and ensuring that screen time is educational and beneficial rather than purely entertaining. These recommendations are grounded in expert advice and research on child development. You might be saying, why should I listen to this? I have witnessed it myself. In many young children exceeding and not exceeding in school, the ones who are exceeding happy are bright, happy children with many social skills. And the ones not exceeding are always on their devices and not very social or nor asking questions. In conclusion, understanding the impact of screen time on a child development is crucial for parents and caregivers. The recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics underscore the importance of limiting screen time and choosing quality content to support healthy cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development in young children. Early recognition of developmental delays and awareness of potential contributing factors, both genetic and environmental, empower families to seek timely interventions and support. But implying these strategies based on experience advice and research we can foster environments the that nurture optimal development and well-being in our children as we navigate the digital age let us prioritize balance and thoughtful approaches to screen time to ensure our children thrive in all aspects of their growth thank you all right McCoy, thank you very much Appreciate it very much. And our third honor student who was with us this morning is Paige. And Paige, we're ready for your speech whenever you are ready. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. So piggybacking off of Aquia, I'm going to be talking about um, internet addiction and how it affects us as young adults, our relationships, and what we can do to improve our mental health through becoming more mindful through our consumption. 
Um, with the depression, anxiety, and all-time high, seeing a recent study found that over 20% of people between the ages of 18 and 25 suffered a major depress from major depression or a major depressive episode in 2023, it's important to look at the current behaviors and practices that we exhibit and how they impact our relationships and connections for better or for worse. What can we do to help ourselves become more mindful of media consumption to strengthen our intimate relationships? It's estimated that over half the population of Earth uses social media, 62.3% of the population, having over 266 million new users joining within the last year, with an estimated 5.6 billion active user identities as of January 2024. Around 40% of the couples in the United States meet on, on dating apps. With everyone so connected um, and access to virtually the entire world at your fingertips, why is it harder now more than ever to feel connected? Today, I'm going to be sharing with you some statistics and research studies that show the dark reality of overconsumption and how internet addiction and social media may be killing romance in the digital age. A study was conducted to, deserve, to observe internet addiction and the content that was consumed by young adults. Addiction described as the in the study as feelings of difficulty regulating the activity, loss of control, minimization of consequences, withdrawal symptoms, emotional distress, attempts to reduce the use, interpersonal conflicts. Problematic online dating was linked to sexual depression, body esteem issues, cognitive distractions, and negative sexual esteem. We've all been subjected to viewing sexually explicit and inappropriate content at some point, whether that be bikini photos of photoshopped influencers that set the beauty standards for women on your feed, um, violent pornographic content in movies, TV, any media anymore uses some kind of sexual exploitation to draw attention. And young people see this as normal now since it's right in front of our face all the time, every day. It was also found in problematic online sexual behaviors went hand in hand with addiction, especially in men. This addiction leads to engaging in progressively more content over time and desensitizes us um, to this exploitation. With there was a, a study done with 80% female participants that completed an online survey assessing problematic online dating, um, and women have adopted, um, have admittedly adopted hypersexual uh, to the hypersexual tone in media. And more and more, we see uh, young women trying to validate themselves via social media from posting suggestive content for more engagement. Um, with online dating, it's easier than ever to meet potential partners, though. It was shown to facilitate the desire for long-term commitment, but this does not guarantee relationships to be satisfying, rather more of a quick fix or a dopamine hit to seek out external validation. The impact of problematic online social behavior on, ex on sexual desire is shown in studies as finding chronic use of social media as primary source of coping strategies such as stress decrease and compensation for unfulfilled desires in real life. One online survey revealed that three out of four people would rather meet a prospective partner organically, but it is something that's dying with the digital age as well. That being said, in contrast, nearly 70% of individuals meet someone on a dating app said that it led to a romantic, exclusive relationship. People between the ages of 43 and 58 found the most success with online dating, with 72% stating that meeting um, up on an online app led to a romantic relationship for them. M males were more likely to meet someone on a dating app that led to an exclusive relationship, 75% compared to 66% of females. Um, in a study that was conducted in 2019, um, it monitored how Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat affected the mental health of 150 college students. And these young people showed depressive symptoms at the start of the study, then reduced their social media by just 10 minutes per day per platform, total of 30 minutes per day for three weeks. Their symptoms of depression and loneliness decreased significantly. Um, that brings me to my final point, what should we do about this? Um, firstly, cut down on screen time. Hang up and hang out. Put that thing down and enjoy your life. Cherish the connections that you've made with the people that you care about. Um, become more mindful of your consumption and realize that most of the big social media companies are trying to keep you addicted as much as um, your attention as possible. So um, be a nonconformist and reject all of that. Reallocate your time into something more personally fulfilling, worthwhile. Get a hobby. Touch grass. Call up your grandma and tell her that you love her. Um, water the garden of your life and watch it grow and don't give all that away to your phone. Uh, media does not define your value. Your worth is not defined by uh, the engagement on your social media posts and how many people you have in your DMs. There's much more to life than being a slave to your screen.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very, very much. Those are my three honor students from our summer semester together um, presenting their honor speeches this morning here on KSJE. Thank you all. Have a very good rest of your summer. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thank you very much.